a third session. We started with a critique of 21st century capitalism. We followed that with a discussion of building a workers' movement in that context. In this session, we will focus on the political aspect of political economy. This means a state, essentially the government, and how political control is the most concentrated expression of class control in a society. In fact, it is a struggle in the political realm that can most effectively unite us as a class across workplaces, across industries, and in every location, cities, counties, and states. And for the Southern Workers' Assembly throughout our region. Our theory discussions are about concepts that help us see the world, help us formulate our ideas, and help us build unity. Language is important. We need a common language to talk with each other and build consensus. We also need to enter the class struggle, firm in our own point of view, and not fall victim to talking like them. These slides and commentary are available for you to review, to study, to share with your family, friends, and coworkers. Now, there are two aspects of fighting in the political arena. One is that we need to reform the state to make changes in the laws that serve us and not just the capitalists. And there'll be more about this. But also there is a visionary task before us. The capitalist vision has created the government and political system we have now. Can't we do better? Once you see who set this up and what they intended, I'm sure you want to see something better. Again, political economy. This is the base of society. Everything else sits on top of this. It can be called the superstructure or all of social life. Every aspect of society is controlled either directly or indirectly by the capitalist class. Of course, there's an illusion of democracy, but even democracy has a class character. First, control of social institutions requires people to have the time and money to play these leadership roles. That's at least one reason there are not more workers in key policymaking positions in the private and public sectors. A media is a good example. It's no coincidence that Jeff Bezos, owner of Amazon, owns the Washington Post newspaper, the main newspaper in the nation's capital, Washington, DC. Every member of Congress and their staff read it every day. The government makes the rules that cover every aspect of society. The class that controls the government makes the rules. The capitalist class has rules since the very beginning. Only in some cases have progressive reformers been able to become mayors, for example. There was Samuel Golden Rule Jones, who lived from 1846 to 1904 in Toledo, Ohio, who took billy clubs away from the police. He set up free kindergartens, promoted public parks, and established an eight hour day for city workers. Henry Ford didn't do this till 1926, some 20 years later. And then there were three socialist mayors elected in Milwaukee, Emile Sedar, Don Hohen, and Frank Zeidler. Of course, we know that there are some mayors today that are more progressive than most. As the political economy changes, we struggle to change our politics. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. What class did the founders serve? The first giveaway is that the main discussion was among the owners of land, property. Remember that is a critical aspect of being a capitalist. Now, even some of them wanted to make George Washington a king. Now check this, he was the richest man in the country at that time. Remember the last sessions I quoted this single spark can start a prairie fire. Well, here's how old George Washington put it when speaking of the discontent of the masses. He said, quote, there are combustibles in every state to which a, star, a spark may set fire. He was talking about you. The process of formulating the Declaration of Independence in the Constitution was led by elite landowners who also owned slaves. Even 10 of the first 12 US presidents were slave owners. 
Now you've heard a lot about Alexander Hamilton because of a recent Broadway musical. Well, what did he think about the constitution? I wanna quote him, he said, he wanted it to give to the rich and well-born a distinct and permanent share in the government. They will check the unsteadiness of the mass of the people. In other words, you, us. Beside these founders met in secret and then their result was not only was only ratified by 17% of the adult males, making matters worse, women, African Americans, native peoples couldn't vote. Now we're supposed to worship them and what they did, huh? Not by a long shot. Now let's fast forward to today and things seem very similar. The rich continue to rule us even after we get more of their democracy. According to democracy, the majority is supposed to rule. That's us. The people in Congress are supposed to represent us, not only in words, but in what they do. It seems that has to be us, not these people lying to us about representing us. The first and only trade union official to be elected to Congress was Charlie Hayes from Chicago, a former vice president of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, he served in Congress from 1983 to 1993. However, in general, the capitalists who rule the workplaces, the economy, either get themselves elected or they pay others to represent them. Now women can vote, but even then, check it. Of the 10 richest members of Congress, three are women. Nancy Pelosi at 115 million, Dianne Feinstein at 88 million, and Susan Del Benny at 79 million. More to our interest, the Congress passed the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution, but then the states didn't ratify it. So there's no law that mandates women get the same pay for the same work by men. The money game seems to dominate politics, and that means the wealthy continue to rule. Politics plays well, pays well or so it seems at the presidential level. Even what many consider the good guys, say Obama and Clinton, they did very well for themselves. Obama increased his wealth by a factor of 13 and Clinton by a factor of 200. We're supposed to accept as normal that these top politicians make such large sums of money. Obama gets $400,000 for a one hour speech. What? The median annual household income was $68,703 in 2019. Obama made six times that in one hour. In the decade or so after Clinton left office, from 2001 to 2012, he made at least 104 million in speaking fees. On the other hand, look at the graph and see what the rest of us face. Our income has grown as well. Well, not as much as theirs, but six times. We're supposed to think that's progress, but the bubble is burst when we examine real purchasing power, which rose only 19%. Well, there's been some reform, we know this. And all is not totally against us. I don't wanna project such a totally negative uh, picture, but there are no guarantees, just the possibility of struggle. So back to the US Constitution. What most of us think is great wasn't even in the Constitution. There are amendments, especially the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments seen in this slide. The founders couldn't agree on these rights for the people. However, the masses of people weren't idly standing by, no. They were fighting in each state against unfair taxation for more representation for their rights. A good example is the Massachusetts Shays' Rebellion of 1786-1787. Workers and farmers rose up against not being amply compensated for military service after the so-called Revolutionary War against the British and being taxed for debts built up during the war. The Shays' Rebellion, along with other such uprisings, taught the founding rulers that they better pay attention to the mood and capacity of the masses prepared to revolt against them. But these rights are just on paper. 
The only way they are put into practice is if we make the capitalist government do what is right by us. Our power is our voice. Our power is when we put our bodies in the street. Our power is when we declare their power illegitimate. When we do that, we win. For example, the Wagner Act of 1935 was a major breakthrough. It legitimated the collectivity of labor in struggle. That's an important role for government. The government began as an agency to protect the owners of private property. With the Wagner Act, the government added a major protection for labor. The National Labor Relations Board was created to arbitrate conflict and guarantee workers the freedom to realize their rights when they fight against the capitalists. The National Labor Relations Board is supposed to be an independent federal agency that protects the rights of private sector employees to join together with or without a union to improve their wages and working conditions. Again, this is the text on paper, but when we are weak, they fade from their responsibility. When we mobilize and get strong, we can make them do their job and back our play. There are many other aspects of the New Deal under FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. For example, in 1935, in 1935, the Social Security Act established retirement benefits for the mass of workers. The Fair Labor Standards Act was passed in 1938. According to this act, Workers must be paid a government set minimum wage and overtime pay must be one and a half times regular pay. Children under 18 cannot do certain dangerous jobs and children under 16 cannot work in manufacturing or mining during school hours. But good times don't last always. A mere 12 years later, a reversal yanked progress into reverse. The Labor Management Relations Act was passed in 1947 called Taft-Hartley. Industrial capitalists directed Congress to, build, to bring a halt to mass unionization. They had to override the veto by President Truman. The rate of unionization has grown, had grown to over 30%, but even that was just a beginning toward the goal of a majority of workers. But now we have been beaten back just at 10%. Today, the rate is vastly different in the public and private sectors. Public sector workers have a unionization rate of almost 35%, but private sector workers are down to just over 6%. In the Southern states, the lowest rate of unionization is in South Carolina at 3.8% and North Carolina at 3.9%. The highest rate and only double digit rate is in West Virginia at 13.3%. The answer to these decline rates of unionization should be clear to all of us. Unionization at the plant level, at the industry level, and in general equals power for workers. Of course, this means that the organization of the union must represent the workers and not deviate based on becoming a bureaucracy or falling under the influence of capital. Like all aspects of this society, unions have had to confront racism, patriarchy, anti-immigrant prejudice, and regional prejudice against the South. At the state level of legislation, there is a pattern of what they call right to work states. What a misnomer. They should be called the right of capitalists to suppress union participation, to maintain greater control of their profit-making schemes against the workers. Over half the states have this kind of retrograde legislation in blue on this map. Note that all of the South is included. This is a legacy of slavery, sharecropping and peonage, limited industrialization and limited urbanization. This so-called right to work legislation is wrong. Check the evidence. Comparing the states with and those without these laws, the pattern is clear. Wages are higher in pro-union states by an average of almost $6,000. Poverty rate is higher in right-to-work states. Less health benefits in right-to-work states. Workplace fatalities in right-to-work states up by 54% over pro-union states. If facts matter, workers need unions. 
these right to work laws are political representation of the interests of capital. The interests of workers would have strong support for all forms of labor organization. This leads us back to politics and the electoral struggle. A major move by capital to take democracy out of elections was in 2010. The Supreme Court ruled that corporations were like people and how they used their money was like speech and they should not be limited. This changed the electoral game. Fundraising from the corporate rich became more important than campaigning for voter support based on issues. But a good, good example of this is that some issues are supported overwhelmingly by people in both parties, but Congress can't pass legislation because their funders say so, say no. In 2008, the average cost of winning a House seat was about $1 million and over $6 million for a Senate seat, and is more now. Is there any surprise that Congress is full of millionaires? Also the first billionaire president, of course, if that's really true. It is possible to buy a candidate, pay for an election victory, and finance legislation. Capitalism turns government into a pay to play game. Of course, they use the media to cover this and play it out like it's democracy at work. The key factor is false consciousness. That's how capitalists maintain control over the minds of people, false consciousness. A militant workers movement has to end this nonsense, clarify our thinking, and set us firmly on a path forward. But where do we turn? The main political activity is between two political parties, both dominated by capitalists. We can't find our future in either of these capitalist parties as they currently exist. Remember, among the leaders of Congress, very rich Democrats are in both the House and the Senate. But history does give us some level of hope. But remember, history is about the past. We need something that takes us into the future, a new future, one we have never really had. In the 19th century, the Republican Party embraced the abolitionists and stood for the end of slavery. Now they are the party of the racist neo-fascist militia and the QAnon fanatics. In the 20th century, the Democrats, led by Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal, created the US version of a welfare state. And then Clinton ended up ending welfare as we had known it, according to him. And remember, workers are in both parties and both involve some level of false consciousness. We do what we have to do in each election, but we have to be clear about what is going on and why we do what we do. The main thing is that both of these are capitalist parties and that means that workers have to find another way. We had made a move toward a labor party in 1996 and maybe that needs to be thought about some more. On the other hand, the day-to-day -day reality of politics, a political program is the art of the possible. Our need is organizing, is an organization of the working class, organizations that enable workers to fight for their interests. Look at these two maps. It's easy to see where the Republicans dominate. These are the states that have right to work less laws. Remember I said the right to work less laws. Of course, not completely, but the pattern is clear. We have work to do at the base of both parties. If the workers are there, that's where we have to be. It's a battle of ideas. And we have to prepare to win our brothers and sisters over to the truth, our truth. Our tactics are mainly not within either of these parties. Our tactics are mainly in the street, marching in mass formation to wake up our people, to point the way forward, to pressure and persuade. Taft Hartley has to be replaced with an even stronger law to advance the cause of organizing labor. Partly this is about a program that can be translated into legislation. Partly this has to be about working class leaders, trade union officials and leading militants of our collective action to run for office and take control of elected office. We are in the majority. It's time we started acting like it. It's not gonna be easy. In plain view for all to see, they rig the electoral process. Here's how they do it. Every 10 years, the government does a census of the population. Political representation is based on population numbers. One exception, the Senate is set up for two seats allocated to each state. 
So Rhode Island, population of 1 million, Montana, 1 million, and Wyoming, a half a million, each has the same political power in the Senate as California, 39 million, Texas, 30 million, and New York, 20 million. That's a 90 million people with the same representation in the Senate as two and a half million. And they still call that democracy. Majority rule? The House of Representatives is composed of 435 seats. The allocation is based on population. First of each state, and then within each state. As population shifts from state to state and from urban to rural, some states gain and some lose seats. Each state legislature then takes the total population of its state and a number of congressional seats that are allocated to them and draws a new map of their district. This is how they steal the elections, meaning here is how a minority can rule over a majority. This slide tells the story. Power is in the hands of the state legislature and each state has bias in favor of rural areas dominated by conservative Republicans. They draw the maps. Check this slide and see what kind of districts can be drawn. The tactic is gerrymandering. Again, does this look like democracy? The main tool we have to fight with in the electoral arena is our vote. First and foremost, we must protect it, especially now. We're to fight with the right wing to stop their tactics of voter suppression. It's not a fair fight because they rigged the system. Furthermore, big money is against us. They pay for their political hacks to cheat. And when we win straight up, they charge fraud. But we need also to be self-critical. As someone once said, to be a non-voter is not to protest, it's to surrender without a fight. Yeah, we all know how most of politics is hypocritical bunch of lying crap. But what we, do, what we also need to believe is that things can be different, that change is possible. It's in the political arena that we can gather all of our forces into big battles. In politics, we move beyond our workplace. We can fight as a class. We can project a workers program. We can run workers in office. We can use our organized structures to build any uh, elected official to hold any elected official accountable. Too many black and brown people don't vote. Too many younger people don't vote. Too many poor people don't vote. This all adds up to the fact that too many of us working people don't vote. So we need a workers program, some basic political demands we can all fight for. All of us can make this demand. We fight for a livable wage. This is a no brainer. Everybody knows this. We need income to live. As long as food, clothing, shelter, health care, and all the other stuff we need cost money, it's common for people to face money running short and having to choose what to do and what not to do. We need a better minimum wage. Check this slide. It's not about teenagers. It's about most of us. We even sell ourselves short in our demands. The current national minimum wage is $750. For a full-time job, that's an annual wage of less than $15,000. The annual income for $15 an hour is a little more than $30,000. The government standard for poverty is a joke. They say at $15 an hour, a family of five can be above the, be above, above the poverty line. Now, who believes that? This is a judgment by a government run by millionaires. A livable wage means that the market has to be controlled. Price controls have to be set. People needs have to be guaranteed. People have a right to live a decent life full of joy, laughter, and love in their pursuit of happiness. All of us can make this demand. We demand Medicare for all. There's no more basic demand than this for ourselves and our families. The first point is that people of this country agree with this demand by more than two to one, 70% in favor, 30% opposed. So what's the big deal holding this up? In a word, healthcare is a commodity and the capitalists are squeezing everything they can get. And from their point of view, to hell with what we want and need. In 2018, healthcare cost the US amounted to about three and a half trillion dollars. 
averaging $11,000 for every person. But of this, almost 35% was an administrative cost. Well, under Medicare, the administrative cost was down to around under 7%. The capitalists love their bureaucracy, especially in billing us and chasing us down to pay our bills. And then the insurance company. Now, the insurance company are bigger than the banks. They employ 2.7 million employees. In the years between 2000 and 2018, 35 big drug companies received a combined total of $11.5 trillion. Government funding pays for a lot of the research for new drugs, and then the drug companies monetize it and sell it back to us. But one good development is that the government is forcing these research findings to be placed in the public domain. But then even then, who's got the money to follow up on this research? A direct connection to this is our next main demand. We demand a safe workplace because safe jobs save lives. The struggles of the 1960s resulted in Congress creating OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in 1970. OSHA's mission is to, quote, assure safe and healthy working conditions for working men and women by setting and enforcing standards and by providing training, outreach, education, and assistance. Now, we did get some results. In 1970, on average, there were 38 deaths every day on the job in the United States. But by 2019, this had declined to 15 deaths a day, from 38 to 15 deaths per day. But damn, that's still people dying every day just by working on their job. The crisis is that OSHA has to be bold and clear in its mandates. It has to have teeth in its enforcement. During the pandemic, under the last administration, they dropped their language down to recommendations and requirements. This, all ha this also happened with the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, being nice to employers who stand by while their workers suffer injury and even death. Okay. Coming to an end, here's another key demand. We demand a safe environment. Now, nature is composed of a complex set of ecosystems, both on land, in the seas, as well as the atmosphere. And people are part of nature, as are all animals and life forms. But we have not had as a primary value living within the laws of nature. Rather, capitalists have tried to act as gods, defying nature and making up their own rules, spontaneously based on what maximizes profit. The highest extent of this is the genetic modification of plants and animals trying to improve on what has taken millions of years of evolution just by virtue of some lab's experiments. We definitely need a new green deal. We have to go beyond the Paris Climate Accord. We have to clean up the oceans and stop using it as a garbage dump, especially with plastics and stuff that will not dissolve for years. This is a global challenge. So the old slogan, workers of the world unite, is no longer a political dream. It's a political urgency. We all share water and air. No national borders make any difference. A workers program is a program for the welfare and benefit of humanity. It is a moral necessity for our future. The Southern Workers Assembly has a role to play. Now this presentation is just the beginning. The workers program we need, the full program, will only develop when we have workers assemblies in every state, in every place where workers are concentrated. We are the voices we need for the consensus. The consensus is a mighty coming together. It is a political concentration of class consciousness. We need to answer this question. What do the workers want? To get the answer, we have to gather them together in serious discussion. When this answer captures the imagination of our class, we will have the beginning of the working class power needed to transform capitalism into a system that truly gives everyone life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, let's talk.